In this lecture, we will be talking about lipids. So first, what exactly are lipids? So lipids is one of the four classes of biomolecules, and this class is characterized by being hydrophobic. So members of this class of biomolecules are basically all water insoluble or have a large majority part or of, part of their parts, a majority of their um, structure are hydrophobic. So there is basically uh, among the different bio, the four classes basic of biomolecules, uh, lipids is unique in being that there is no defining characteristics with them. Unlike carbohydrates, which is characterized by multiple hydroxide groups with our amino acids or other proteins being that they have these chains of amino acids and nucleic acids or nucleic acids, RNA and DNA as the chains of nucleotides, lipids are very diverse. Again, they do not have uh, a signature structure, but they have this unifying trait. And the unifying trait of lipids is that they are water insoluble. They are all hydrophobic. So most common lipids of the body are fatty acids and the esters of these fatty acids. So for functions, um, of course, lipids functions as energy storage. In fact, uh, lipids are one of the highest uh, densest energy storage molecules, more dense than um, the actual uh, carbohydrates, which is the main source of energy. And then uh, another important function is in cell membrane. In fact, the reason uh, why they are parts of the cell membrane or they are very integral to the cell membrane is because they are actually hydrophobic. And this hydrophobicity uh, lends the uh, lends these uh, properties, these functions to what makes the cell membrane fluid yet separate from water. Then it also serves as a thermal blanket and cushion. And some of the lipids are precursors to hormones, especially the sex hormones, um, testosterone, uh, estrogen, androgen. So here are, uh, because they are very diverse, so as you can see, these are um, a loose classification of the lipids. So you have um, polyphenyl compounds, including the lipids uh, comprising of steroids, lipid vitamins, and other terpenes. You have phospholipids, usually found in um, cell membranes. You have glycolipids. Um, these are major classification or groups. And as you can see here, they're actually very diverse and has a wide uh, class or wide variety. So here is another view. So as you can see, it's slightly different with um, with the previous one. And that um, hammers into uh, notice or basically it brings to notice that really lipids have very diverse uh, structures. Uh, some, uh, it's quite difficult to classify them. But these are just, again, loose classifications of these lipids. So let's look at some examples or some well-known bio uh, lipids found in biological systems. So the first one are the fatty acids. So fatty acids, fats, and acids, so they are consist of hydrocarbon chain with the carboxylic acid at one end. So the general structure of your lipid is of rather fatty acid is that you have a long chain hydrocarbon and a carboxylic acid. That's why it's called an, a fatty acid because it's a carboxylic acid. So the, the, the long chain is basically this is the nonpolar side and they have just a three atom uh, polar side but they are still classified as lipid because they have majority of this one is actually nonpolar so they form uh, some of the lip fatty acids have double bonds and for naturally occurring fatty acids these double bonds occur as cis configuration so they they are on the, the the carbon chains are on the same side and that provides a kink so you have a kink in the chain so those um, most naturally occurring fatty acids have an even number of your carbon atoms and when we name it we name the carboxylic acid carbon as the first carbon and the farthest carbon because again some of them uh, has lengths of around 14, 16, 18, 22, 24 carbons. So the farthest carbon is usually dis displayed as an omega. Okay. And then we designate um, 
the the double bond position uh, as the superscript of the delta. So here is some examples of fatty acid. So we have myristic acid. 14 zero that means you have 14 carbons and no double bonds and then you have 16 zero palmitic acid usually found in palm oils actually um coconut oil is mostly made up of palmitic acid that's why it's called palmitic palm oil palms coconuts so you have stearic acid as well and then for the double bonds so this is oleic acid is 18 dash one so 18 18 carbons with one double bond. And the double bond is a cis double bond in the nine position. That means it's the nine carbon. So here are some other examples. And then some essential fatty acids for humans. You have the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, you have heard of that from some uh, commercials on tuna and um, heart health. So omega-3, omega-6. So what does omega-3, omega-6 means? It means... Uh, the double bond is on the third carbon from the from the end from the omega position. So this ALA is omega three. So what is ALA? Alpha linolenic acid. So this is an omega three because this is found basically on the uh, third carbon from the from the end from the omega position. So it refers to this 15 here. Then we have omega-6 LA. So LA is linolenic acid, linoleic acid. Uh, the position here referring to the 6th position that is actually 12 here. So these are precursors of some important lipids in the body. So that's why they are essential fatty acids. Uh, not only because they are precursors but because we cannot uh, synthesize them. We must get them from our diet. So we have these essential fatty acids that we need. So um, for the chemistry of fatty acids, basically what reactions do they have? Um, fatty acids, especially for saturated fatty acid, that means they do not have double bonds. They, they rarely react because they are hydrocarbons. They are quite inert. And the reaction is mostly on the carboxylic acid side. But for this... Uh, for some fatty acids that have double bonds, they they do and they can react. And some of the reactions are peroxidations. So peroxidation is a non-enzymatic reaction catalyzed by oxygen. So it may occur in tissues or in foods, and that's one of the causes of spoilage. And even some oils, especially uh, olive oils, um, canola oils, ah no, not canola, olive oils and uh, say butter, they can become rancid. So they spoil because of this peroxidation reaction. So hydroperoxide is formed and is very reactive and leads to the formation of free radicals. And when we we, uh, we take that, when we um, ingest that, it can cause uh, cancer and aging because we ingest basically free radicals. So this principle, peroxidation, or although not all peroxidation reaction is harmful. In fact, we make use of some peroxidation reactions when you use drying oils. Because they really form hard, waterproof films. And uh, those peroxidation reactions is really good for, say, um, uh, the peroxidation reaction is good for for the varnishes and finishes. So here are the peroxidation reactions that we have. So we have, uh, basically, it occurs on the double bonds. So for peroxidation reaction to occur, your fatty acid will have double bonds. And it reacts with oxygen. And it forms um, cross-links between adjacent fatty acids. And so you will end up with, basically, a, a strong uh, waterproof film because they repel water. So here are... Um, the industrial applications of peroxidation. So it's the ease of auto-oxidation and polymerization of oils, especially important in paints and varnishes. So they are oil-based paints, oil-based varnishes. So the more unsaturation in the oil, the more likely the drying process because as you have seen in the previous slide, the peroxidation occurs on the double bonds. So we have some non-drying oils, semi-drying and drying oils that we used usually for again finishes and varnishes in furnitures so other uh, reactions of fatty acids we have transesterification
This is acid catalyzed, so you have an enzymatic process here. So acid catalyzed exchange between the R groups of esters. These are frequently used in polyester, methanolysis, and biodiesel industries. So you have transesterifications. You produce uh, metal esters and uh, glycerols. So you break down the fats. So another one is hydrogenation. So hydrogenation aims to reduce the bonds in saturated fatty acids. And it also, uh, some of the consumer oils, food used consumer oils are actually um, partially or fully hydrogenated to prevent going rancid. So why does it go rancid? Because again of the double bonds. It undergoes peroxidation because of the double bonds. So to prevent that, they hydrogenate it, they, they, they remove the double bonds. Unfortunately, uh, the industrial process of um, hydrogenation, actually, instead of, of removing the double bonds, it changes the configuration instead to uh, from a cis double bond to a trans double bond. The peroxidation reaction does not go away. And what's more, it produces basically uh, a type of oil that is quite unhealthy um, because they tend to um, easily um, clump and build up. So trans fats, these are the trans fats that you have heard are very bad for your health. The reason being because they are in the trans configuration, they are easier to solidify. And when they solidify inside your body, they can cause blockages in your arteries and blood vessels. That's uh, the, the, the thing about trans fats. Now, um, another one, another reaction of fatty acids is in saponification. So, in saponification, by its name, uh, saponify, sapon, or basically soap. It's a way to produce soap. So, you, have, you hydrolyze your fat with a base, basically lye reactions, and you remove uh, the glycerol as glycerin, and then you get the soap. Soap is basically fatty acids. So you 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 you, you, um, you have the reaction of the oil with the base. You end up with the soap. So uh, a saponification number is basically uh, regards your how long your chain, uh, your fatty acid chain would be. So saponification number is the milligram of hydroxide per gram of fat that would be produced. Now, with regards to soaps, we have several types of soaps depending on the solution, uh, the, the starting materials, so what type of base you are using, and what type of oil you are using. So, ordinary hard soap is made from sodium hydroxides, so sodium soap. Then we have a rather soft soap. They are made from potassium hydroxides, and they are from, the oil is from coconut and palm oil. So, another one is Castile soap from olive oil. We have the green soap with a mixture of sodium and potassium green seed oil. So you have a transparent soap that contains sucrose, a floating soap that are formed by incorporating air. So it floats. So you have calcium and magnesium soaps that are very poorly water soluble. So they're basically hard soaps and uh, basically insoluble. So aside from saponification, we have iodine number. So iodine number if, uh, is the measure of the degree of unsaturation in a given amount. So if the saponification number tells us that uh, the amount, that the chain length of your hydrocarbon in your fatty acid, the iodine number gives us an idea of the degree of unsaturation. How many double bonds do you have in your um, in your fatty acids? So the calculation is the number of grams of iodine absorbed by 100 grams of fat. So this is uh, a common um, reaction or a common uh, QA uh, technique used in manufacturing. So aside from that, we also have acetyl number, the number of milligrams of hydroxide needed to neutralize acetic acid of one gram of acetylated fat. So basically you have your fatty acid uh, react with acetic anhydride so you get your fatty acetylated fatty, fatty acids. So this is your acetyl number. Then we have another one, Ricard-Mason number, measures the amount of volatile fatty acids. 
this one is on how much volatile um, fatty acids you have. So what do you mean by volatile fatty acids? Um, because you have uh, most of the oils and fats that we have talked about here have are actually um, very long and very large. 16 carbons, around 16 carbons in length. Uh, they are not technically volatile but some some fats have only about four some of them two two three four five carbons in length and these are actually quite volatile because they are very light small amount of carbons makes them light that is they are easy to um uh go into the gaseous phase and now uh, what are some examples of that one so the fats and oils the volatile oils in butter eh, which make gives them these buttery notes buttery caramel notes this actually those are because of this volatile fatty acid in fact some of the um, the aroma compounds in our food are actually from fatty acids and that is why greasy and fatty foods are usually the most flavorful because these flavor compounds are actually fat soluble. They are lipids. They dissolve more on the fats and the greasy and the fatty foods are the one that has the most aroma and tasty. Yes. So uh, here the ratio may, the RM number um is basically the higher the RM number, the higher the, the amount of volatile fats you have. Butter in particular has a high RM number because it's made, uh, it's composed of many volatile fats. So when we talk about fats and oils, what are, how are they different? So fats and oils, when we look at them in their structure, chemical structure, they are actually the same. The only difference is that fats are solids at room temperature while oils are liquids at room temperature what makes um, them solid and what makes the other liquid is the number of carbon if you have a short number or a small number of carbon say um, 14 10 carbons you tend to be solids or semi-solids you tend to be to simplify easily if you are saturated you tend to be solidify easily as well whereas if you are long and unsaturated that means you have many double bonds you tend to be liquid even at room temperatures and that actually makes a lot of difference so for example um, in baking when you add we usually add fats in our big products when the fat source is say butter you cannot refrigerate or when you refrigerate the cake it tends to go hard because again it's made up of fat. The, the thing that you incorporated are fats. So it solidifies at um, low temperature. Whereas if it's if the fat or the, the oil you added is say a cooking oil or a vegetable oil, it tends to stay soft even if you uh, put it in the refrigerator. So that's one of the main differences between the fats and the oils. So oils uh, tend to be more liquid and does not solidify easily at even at lower temperature although if you put it in the freezer for a very long time they still solidify so um, other lipids we have waxes waxes are simple esters of fatty acids so we usually see them in lip bulbs uh, candles beeswax so these are very very long chain alcohols with very very long chain fatty acids so many uh, hydrophobic side hydrophobic side very hydrophobic and because of this um, the, the very long chain as well as some of them being uh, saturated so you have your uh, they tend to clump and form waxy substances so examples of this one are beeswax spermaceti and canuba carnuba waxes so beeswax is of course comes from the bees it's from the um, the honeybee um, hive, and then spermaceti is from your whale oil, and canuba wax is from a palm tree. So here are some examples of these wax. So these are these wax. This is the source of the canuba wax, and for the spermaceti. So other glycerides. Uh, glycerides is actually um, it's strictly glycerol. Uh, glycerides means you have a glycerol 
with fatty acids, with the fatty acid component. So, it's called glyceride from glycerol. Although, strictly speaking, glycerol is carbohydrate. But, uh, they are mostly associated with lipids because they tend to form esters called glycerides. So, you have monoglyceride if you have this glycerol compound partnered with your fatty acids. Diglyceride, two fatty acids, one glycerol. Triglyceride is one fatty acids, three glycerol. So what is this function? These are actually your fat. Fatty acids with plus glycerol is your fat. This is your fats and coils. We call them triglycerides, another name for fat. So here is the reaction. So this is the glycerol side, and these are the fatty acid side. So usually three for fats, but when we functionalize one side, so basically glycerol, can have three um, functional groups connected to this one. This is your glycerol backbone. You can add any fatty acid you want here, and then you can add another functional group here. So if the functional group is a phosphate group, it's called a phosphoglyceride. And these are actually the major constituent of your cell membranes. So your cell membrane is made up of this glycerol plus the phosphate group plus your two fatty acids. So it's still under lipids because these two fatty acids are very water insoluble. They are hydrophobic. The hydrophilic side here is only the phosphate group. So this compound is made up of half of them hydrophobic, half of them hydrophilic. So we can actually functionalize the other, the X group here in your phospholipids depending on what type of phospholipid we have. We want to have. Basically, there are many different types of phospholipids. And that's what makes our cell membrane unique and dynamic. But the general um, structure of this phospholip phospholyserides, or we call them phospholipids, are basically you have a two, um, two chains or two legs or two tails, depending on the source book you read, two tails plus a polar head. So the non-polar tails and the polar heads. So the polar region is the glycerol, the phosphate group, and the functional group X. And then the non-polar side is the fatty acid. So when you have a molecule that half polar, half non-polar, we call them amphifatic. So recall amphibians, animals that live on land and live on water. For this type of molecule, molecules that are... Half of them loves water, half of them hates water, so they are amphiphatic. And these are actually the ideal compounds for creating your membranes, or we can say them bilayers, the lipid bilayer. So they form two layers uh, with the tails facing one another and the heads outside. The outside is water, so the hydrophobic side is facing the water. Sorry, hydrophilic side is facing the water. Hydrophobic side is inside, um, joining together against water. So this is another view of your phosphoglyceride molecule. The polar group, this is actually the phosphate group. This is the X, a functional group. So in this case, you have choline. And then you have your fatty acid chain. Now, why is it bent? The, bend is, uh, the bending is caused by the cis double bond. And this is what I was talking about a while ago about fatty acids. Um, the saturated, this is the saturated fatty acid. You have a straight chain. For the unsaturated fatty acids, especially cis unsaturated, you have this kink. We call it kink, this bent side here. And that's what makes your compound fluid. Now, if this cis configuration becomes a trans, you end up with another straight shape. And that makes um, the, the lipid uh, easier to clump together. If you have this kink, it does not clump together. But if you do not have this kink, all of them are straight, it would clump together. So in our body, we want our membranes to be fluid. So we want these kinks, these double bonds, so that we both clump together. So another um, group, functional groups here is basically the inositol group. So here are some enumerations. So from here, we have enumerations of the functional groups attached to the phosphate group of your um, the phospholipids. So inositol, inositol, you have, um, in this case, you have an ether group, a phosphate, and then attached to your ether group. So they are usually used in, uh, you found them in PATH, 
platelet activating factor, which is a med mediator for inflammation, allergic response, and shock. And this um, ether linkage is necessary because it provides stability to this phospholipid. So plasmogens also. So you see, uh, you can see this, um, the ether glycerophospholipids. Having an ether group here provides another nonpolar group and gives it a more um, easier stability, stability. They tend to clump together and that is actually the function of this one because you can find them in platelet activating factor. What's the role of this one? To form blood clots. And then you have sphingolipids. So sphingolipids are derivatives of the lipid sphingosine which is a long hydrocarbon chain and a polar domain that includes an amino group. So it is similar to phospholipid but it's different in that instead of having a glycerol backbone, it uses sphingosine. But the general shape is the same. You have two tails and a polar head. So other uh, derivatives of this one, so you can functionalize one group of this one can form ceramides, sphingomyelins. And usually sphingolipids, you find them in the membranes of your neurons, the neurons and the glial cells, the cells associated with our neurons, basically. So sphingosines, sphingolipids, they are important in our nervous system. So yeah, cerebrocytes, gangliosides, uh, cerebro, um, because they are usually found in the city uh, on our brain, the gangliocytes, the, the ganglia associated with our neurons. So these are actually the uh, phospholipids, sphingolipids that are associated with the central nervous system. So these are the structure of our gangliocytes. So cerebrocytes, sulfides, tubocytes, these are just uh, other variations of this one, but they all share the same overall characteristics. You have nonpolar tails and a polar heads. The polar heads can be functionalized, and that's why we have this variety. Cerebrocytes, sulfabides, tubocytes, gangliocytes, these varieties because of the polar heads. They have different functional groups. Then we have the cardiolipids. So these are polyglycerol phospholipids and made up 15% of the total phospholip uh, lipid phosphorus content of the myocardium. Myocardium associated with your cell membrane. Myocardium, these are on the um, cells, mu mus muscle cells of the heart. And they are called cardiolipids. So you have this uh, associated in the heart. Then sulfolipids, it's called sulfolipids because you have a sulfur group, but generally, Similar, you have this polar head and a non-polar tail with cis double bonds. So, uh, because we have lots of different uh, lipids, we have, uh, in order to manufacture these lipids, we need to have metabolic pathways for them. And to have these metabolic pathways, we need to have enzymes. And if there are some issues with these enzymes, we get what you call the lipid storage diseases. So, the lipid storage diseases are the group of inherited metabolic disorders in which harmful amounts of fatty, fatty materials, the lipids, accumulate in various tissues and cells in the body. So, they are also called sphingolipidosis, and these are genetic. They are genetic because the usual cause of these diseases are problems with the enzyme. And if the enzyme is a problem, that means it's the genes which is uh, which encodes this enzyme that are the actual cause. And if there's the genes, if it's in the genes, it is most likely genetic, inherited from parent to offspring. So these are due to the, to the deficiency or the absence of this catabolic enzyme. So we have several lipid storage diseases, the Tay-Sachs, Gaukers, Neiman Parks, and the Fabris. These are just of some few of them. So first is a Tay-Sachs disease, usually in the neurons, the affected region is in the neurons. So in an inability to actually process the lipids and then they accumulate in the neurons and then the neurons die. Then you have Fabris diseases. So you have uh, again, uh, this time it's in the lysosomes of most of our cells. So you have Neiman Picks diseases. The, the, the issue here is on the white blood cells. So it's in the immune system. So uh, as you can see from this lipid storage diseases, um, 
the the common theme is that they cannot process lipids properly, but the affected organ could be widely different. So that's for the lipids. Now let's move on to cholesterol and related compounds. So for cholesterol, uh, you have heard cholesterol as being bad for the heart. It's the cause of um, cardiovascular diseases. But cholesterol uh, in our body is important. It's an important constituent of the cell membrane. And it provides fluidity to your membrane. That's why it's important. It prevents our membrane from being too rigid at colder temperatures and being too fluid in very warm temperatures. So a cholesterol is characterized by this rigid forming structures with a hydroxyl group here and along an, a hydrocarbon chain along there. So this is your cholesterol, a very small innocuous compound that was found in heart plaques and arterial plaques. And that is why they are associated with cardiovascular diseases. So cholesterol is largely hydrophobic, meaning the gray areas here, they are hydrophobic. The only hydrophilic side here is the red one here. So Although it's mostly hydrophobic, it's considered still amphipathic because you have a hydrophilic group on one side. So cholesterol is characterized by this ring system, which is actually shared by many other compounds. The precursor for the ring system is this eicosanoids. You have this arachidonic acid that is um, derivatized and you form your uh, five ring, uh, four ring structure. And when you have this forming steroid structure, you can actually form other compounds here like the hormones and signaling molecules. So eicosanoids are the compounds that are precursors or actually the final product of your hormones and signaling compounds. So here are some eicosanoids, prostaglandins, prostacyclines, thromboxanes, leukotrienes. These are actually... Um, signaling compounds and their functions is on inflammation, fever, regulation of blood pressure, blood clotting, immune system modulation, control of the reproductive processes because your sex hormones are actually eicosanoid or derivatives of eicosanoids. The regulation of the sleep-wake cycle, they're actually important. So another class of lipids are the terpenes. So terpenes are simple lipids but lack these fatty acid components. So you cannot see an ad, a long chain car hydrocarbon with an alcohol group. That's not your fatty acid. But you can see here hydrophobic, hydrophobic compounds and they are terpenes. So we have monoterpenes. You have basically the number of isoprene units. So how many rings can you see here? So those are your terpenes. So terpenes, they can be small, they can be very long, they can be uh, a large variety of compounds. The commonality is that they are hydrophobic. So most of them are found in as metabolites, signaling molecules, etc. Now, um, let's look at lipid link proteins and the lipoproteins. Let's look at the membranes. So lipid link proteins, these are lipids with protein attachments. So you have lipids, one group of biomolecules, and a protein, another group of biomolecules, but you link them together. So lipid link proteins, lipoproteins. So they are usually found in cell membranes. So you have three most common types, prelinked, fatty acylated, and glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol link, GPI link proteins. So quite a, hand, uh, a mouthful, but basically it describes... What type of lipid are the proteins linked to? That's, that's the basis of this one. So here are some um, fatty acidated proteins. So this is your protein, this orange um, ribbon here, and then these are your fatty acids, or rather your lipids. So the lipid here is linked to your protein covalent bond, and this is um, a, a fatty acidated protein. So another protein here, Link to your lipids. This is the lipid side. So you have this uh, fatty uh, protein, uh, lipoproteins. So for prenylated, basically uh, the, the common theme here is that you have a protein, and then you have the hydrophobic lipids that are integrated in the cell membrane. This one here is your cell membrane. Usually integrated, uh, it serves as an integrated. Um, they are actually proteins that are integrated 
into the cell membrane or associated with the cell membrane. The association is based on the links with the lipid. So these are GP binding. Again, you have this protein, but the, the additional step here is that you have another class of biomolecule, the carbohydrates, also in the mix. Proteins, carbohydrates, lipids. These are the GP binding proteins. Three out of four of the biomolecules. Then the lipoproteins, particles found in the plasma that transport lipids, including cholesterol. So lipoproteins are mostly found in the bloodstream. So you have this, uh, and they are classified based on the density. Uh, when we have, uh, when we say density, that means the ratio of fats to lipoproteins, lipid to proteins. Low, low, the low density means you have lots of uh, lipids or fats in small amount or limited number of proteins. High density means more on proteins, less on fats. Because lipids, like oils, float on water. Basically, lipids are less dense. So when you have a low density lipoprotein, you basically have means to say that it's very fatty. It's high on the lipids. And the LDLs are actually the bad cholesterol. We, we know them uh, in common, uh, in layman's term, as LDLs, the low-density lipoproteins. Whereas uh, the healthy oils or the healthy, the good cholesterol, as they say, are the very low-density, sorry, the high-density lipoproteins. So LDLs are bad, HDLs are the good ones. And then the very bad ones are the VLDLs and the chylomicrons. These are the very, very lowest density. Uh, lipoproteins. So they circulate in our bloodstream and they provide an exchange of lipids from our diet, from the uh, synthesis of our body, even uh, storage of lipids in our uh, liver. So here are here is a table of the percentage of lipids and the uh, their diameter and their size and density. So you have HDL high density. Uh, lipoproteins with the highest density and the lowest densities in the chylomicrons. So highest number of triacylglycerol, high fatty, very fatty, is the chylomicrons. And then the lowest fat is HDL. Lowest, uh, highest number of phospholipid, basically protein-associated lipids. These are the proteins. Highest is in HDL. So they are the good, healthy fats. So you, basically, the reason why we want to have a high HDL in our bloodstream high in good cholesterol, as they say, is because uh, they tend to interact with the fats, fatty compost components of our, of the other parts of our body. They take up these fats and then they, they, they act as sweepers. So it's like a, a sponge that is dry. So if you have a dry sponge, it easily soaks up the liquids. Whereas you have a wet sponge, it does not soak up liquid. Instead, it can even um, increase the wetness in the in the area that you want to say why. So basically, it's something in that idea is that HDL sweeps out the sweeps up the floating lipids in our bloodstreams and eliminates them, whereas LDLs, the low density lipoproteins, increases the fats floating around in our bloodstream and can cause the clumps. Uh, the plaques, the arterial plaques that we have. So here is how the lipids circulate throughout the body. This is all throughout the bloodstream. So the liver is the central hub and uh, it's, it's actually the one that controls where the lipids, uh, the, fine, the starting point and the final destination of the lipids. So this is how the body, I won't dwell too much on this one, but um, this is the, uh, as I, again, as I said, the liver as the central hub because it receives the low LDLs and the VLDLs. That is why we have these fatty liver diseases. So again, if you have HDLs, these are the good fats. Uh, you tend to actually clean up your liver, you clean up your bloodstream, but you have, you eat very fatty foods. You do not have anything that can sweep up the fats, so it would tend to accumulate in your body. And that ends the lecture in, uh, about lipids.